Lawrence Fox, welcome to Acting Prime Minister and thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Before you even say anything on this podcast, I think lots of people will already have a bit of an idea about you, whether they whether they like you or whether they don't like you. Uh, and actors traditionally love to be adored, don't they? I mean, I wonder how you feel about being a, a divisive figure at the moment. Oh, actors love being adored. Yes. Um, <laughs> you, as an actor, you'll get a lot of adoration, but it... Um, yeah, it also does get you know it gets tiring after a while, and uh, the the political arena is more interesting in a way because people tell you exactly what they think rather than just saying, "Oh, that's a wonderful idea." Yes, brilliant! You're fantastic. Um, look, whether whether your fans on Twitter and your uh, <laughs> less amiable uh, people on Twitter want you to be or not, we're going to make you prime minister now. And um, we always like to settle our guests into, into Downing Street first. So you can take any personal item that you like with you from home into Downing Street. What is the personal item that you would want to take with you, do you think? I think I'd probably take my piano. Um, and uh, yeah, that would be it. I'd take my piano. If, if I'm only allowed one desert island in this style, I'd take my piano. Obviously, my children. Of course, but uh, but you know, as far as a sort of inanimate object, it would be my piano, yeah, yeah, because you are, as well as being an actor, of course, you are a singer songwriter too. So, I guess music's pretty important to you. And is it part of how you, you sort of relax and unwind, or yes, it is. And actually, I find it's quite a good way of working out what you think. You know, writing song lyrics is quite a good way of working out what you think. So uh, I was listening because uh, I got a thing from the record people who released my first album as uh, the other day, and it said uh, it's the anniversary of it. So I listened back to it as I do once a year, whenever they send me that email. And it was uh, it's quite political even then, back in two thousand and whenever it was thirteen or fourteen. Okay, and what is the drink that you'd pour yourself then? Maybe you've played a bit of piano in Downing Street. Now you've got to go through your red box. What's the drink you'd pour yourself to, to relax yourself at night and, and plow through your workload? So it's night time now, is it? it I, well, it, annoyingly, I can't work and drink at the same time. I, and my memory is the first thing to go. So I'll forget, even after like half a sip of wine, I'll forget. <laughs> so if I was working, it would have to be a decaf coffee, annoyingly, or maybe a seed lip and tonic. Um, and if I wasn't working and I was just like going, look, you know, enjoy your first night in Downing Street, which I sure doubt ever happens. It would be a gin and tonic, Hendrix and tonic with a uh, bit of cucumber. That decaf coffee is never going to last long in Downing Street. You're going to have to get back on the on the caffeinated. Tell me about it. <laughs> uh, and who's the first person you'd call as prime minister? My dad. Yeah. Yeah. And he'd say, "Don't mess it up." Let, let's talk a bit about your background, actually, because you you know you are from. A bit of an acting dynasty. Um, your uncle's an actor, brother, your cousins. Um, you went to the infamous Harrow School before being expelled just before your A levels. Then you worked as a in a few different jobs, including as a gardener before going to RADA uh, and having a very successful career in acting. Uh, you're best known, of course, for your role playing DS James Hathaway in the ITV drama Lewis. And um, but you've also starred on stage and in film. And then came question time this year on the BBC, where you arguably sort of propelled yourself into, into politics after some controversial comments on race. Um, and then that has led you down this path of setting up the Reclaim Party uh, and running for office. So there's a lot to talk about there in terms of your background. Um, but firstly, you know, you did have a successful career in acting, a very successful career. Is it the case that you can't get acting jobs now because you have been outspoken on, on politics? Is, is that true? Um, certainly there's been a, a yes, I think, is the answer. I mean, I don't know. I still get emails from my American manager who says they want you to be in, someone's looking to see whether you'd be in this film. But actually, um, I think yes, because I think uh, show business is very, very much a monoculture uh, in a lot of ways. So there is a prescribed set of views that one needs to adhere to. Otherwise, you're going to probably get in trouble. But um, no, I think I'm also a bit too busy to uh, do any acting. I haven't, it, it, in, in fact, since my political venture uh, and movement started, it feels like someone said action and no one said cut. 
So it's like constant. Usually as an actor, they just go, action, you concentrate really hard for a period of time. And then they say, cut, and you can relax again. But on this game, it's just unending. It's it's solid. Action, 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 go, 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 go. Because you have set up this this reclaim party now. How how intensive is that then? I mean, you say it's go, go, go. What what is it that you're you're focusing on at the moment? What is it that ta- that's taking up all your time? a million things from recruiting right people to work with to getting the policy platform put together in a way which is decent and um you know essentially actually for this week i've um because it's just been manic for the last month i've told everyone to sort of leave me alone a bit so i can sit down and write because it's weird you know read and write you forget if you're too busy running around doing stuff you forget to do the things that actually change and inform your thinking which are which are reading and writing so i've been writing this week i don't want this podcast to become a sort of a back catalogue of your your most controversial comments that's not really the point of the of the podcast but mainstream comments <laughs> <laughs> but we you know we do need to we do need to touch on them because it it was partly what propelled you into sort of the spotlight in terms of politics and when you went on Question Time earlier this year, it was you know talking. The, the debate was about Meghan Markle and whether she'd been a, a victim of racism, and and you argued that, that that you didn't think so. And an audience member picked you up and accused you of of having white privilege, uh, and then you accused that audience member of of using sort of racist terminology, and the whole thing turned into this big storm. Um, but it does seem sometimes to some people that that maybe you do just quite enjoy the argument, and you are sort of in it for the for the row and that you quite enjoy maybe offending people is that is that fair um well i think i was probably on question time i think i was probably the offended one wasn't i you know i didn't really bring race into it i mean i don't mind actually you can offend me i think i defend anyone's right to uh, to be offensive should they wish to be so i don't particularly like offending people it's not my intention my intention is to try and encourage a dialogue um, but the problem is in very polarized situations and difficult conversations when people when people are employing very negative and horrible tactics to you, you the w- w- thing you shouldn't do and bullying tactics in a lot of cases is what you shouldn't do is retreat and lie down. I believe that we should be able to be fearless. So if someone wants to take me on intellectually, in good faith, I will take them on intellectually in good faith. And if someone wants to take me on intellectually in bad faith, then I, they'll get as good as I give as good as I get. I think that's fair enough. Um, I'm usually pretty uh, pretty good with with people who engage with me with, with a decent argument, and I will always invite them out for coffee. But it's, it's quite difficult sometimes to get people from what would be called traditionally the other side of the conversation to go for a coffee. Sometimes. Are you sorry for any of the comments that you've made, though? If they have just you know, upset people. Usually when I'm sorry, I apologize. That's, I'm, I'm very well, I'm, I'm very well known for, if I've made a mistake, I put my hands up and I go, I've made a mistake. Okay. And given that you haven't apologized, I guess that means that you're not sorry. Mm. <laughs> no. Well, look, let's imagine that you're prime minister now. Let's put those controversial comments to one side because, you know, I want to talk to you a bit about politics. Um, and, as Prime Minister, you can make your first free speech to the nation. Uh, what are you going to tell them you stand for and what your new Reclaim Party stands for exactly? That's a big one. I stand for reclaiming the uh, language primarily uh, so that we can learn to use it accurately and freely and uh, that people aren't uh, losing their jobs and self-censoring and fearing saying something for the for the fact that they'll be jumped on immediately and um, have deep sanction taken against them professionally. I would encourage people to be optimistic and hopeful rather than um, tarnish themselves with the sort of overwhelming view that we are systemically racist. I would tell them that this is a wonderful country and a wonderful union and that we should be optimistic and progressive, genuinely progressive, in terms of the way we offered ourselves out into the world. What do you make then of the way that Greg Clark, the chairman of the FA, was was sacked yesterday? Because this probably taps into the exact argument you're making. He he made some remarks. He used the word coloured, for example. He suggested that gay people uh, had made a sort of life choice. People found that offensive and he resigned. Do you think it was right for him to to go, or do you think he should have stayed? I, I I don't agree with Greg Clark on his statements at all. But do I believe that he has the right to make them? One hundred percent. And do I believe that he um, 
do I believe that this, this, this misappropriation of language that you can say colored, you can't say colored person, but you can say person of color and one is a career ending thing and the other one is fine, is typical of, of these, this way that our language is being abused. It's like, why, it's a distinction without a difference, you know? And, and it's like, to me, that makes no sense. And, or, you know, I think he's, you're having your thoughts and your words pleased and I don't think that's a good thing. It doesn't seem to make the world a happier place. That's all I've noticed. I'm noticing more, as we search for more inclusion, we're finding more division. I suppose for Greg Clark, the issue there, though, was partly about the fact he was, you know, he was trying to talk about diversity in football and he was being asked about that. And, and the, the question, question is whether he really has a handle on diversity if he doesn't know the correct terminology to use to avoid offending people um, that he's talking about. It just, it just didn't feel as though he was particularly well educated on the topic. Correct. I mean, correct terminology. What is the correct terminology? I would argue it's totally fine to say coloured people. I mean, I would say that's fine. It's, and I'd also argue that it's totally fine to say person of colour. And I wouldn't say that it made any difference at all whatsoever. If you're going to seek offence in sw swapping words around, then, you know, no one is going to win. It's a very, very difficult position to be in. It's the same with all of these things, social justice and all of these things. They're just confusing monikers that are applied to words and they're, in, they're created in order to instill fear in you and the way you use your language. Greg Clark is Greg Clark. He's not me. He's got his own life. Isn't it up to those communities, though, that, that he's talking about to sort of suggest the terminology that they would prefer? That, that's just kind, isn't it, to say to them, you know, what is the terminology you, you like to use and we'll use that too? Yeah, same as me saying, I would like the terminology for you to use to not say white privilege, but I don't get to choose, do I? I get to have an opinion about it, but I don't get to choose. OK, well, let's talk about some of the other issues that you would face as Prime Minister now. And um, you've talked about reclaiming institutions too as part of the sort of the, the mission statement of the party. What would that look like exactly? What do you mean when you say you want to reclaim institutions? Um, any government funding that is any, uh, sorry, any taxpayer money that is spent on institutions that adopt policies like critical race theory or trying to decolonize the curriculum or anything like that, I just remove the funding from them. So I'm sorry, I, I don't think the ta your, your average taxpayer is keen on this ideo ideology being taught in them um, and being propagated in our institutions. I mean, a lot of what you're arguing for, you're sort of coming from a similar position as Nigel Farage, who just renamed his own Brexit party, the Reform Party. You're not just tempted to team up with him on some of these things? No, I'm a very different kettle of fish from Nigel Farage, I think. I think you did go to a demonstration with him on the weekend, though, didn't you? So, you, you know, you do no, share... No, you were at the, well, you, you were you were demonstrating about the same cause, though, weren't you? Whether you were at the same demonstration, you were doing the same thing, weren't you? No, I was going to. My, both of my grandfathers were in the Royal Artillery. I, um, together, we organised a group of people to go together, and we marched down from Green Park Tube with some veterans and some pipers. And Nigel Farage was nowhere to be seen. So yeah. um, I, I did. I think. Um, I think. I'm not very good on on Nigel or it's Richard Tice, isn't it? Who's his, who's his, uh, uh, you know, companion. I think yeah. Richard Tice was there somewhere, but he was certainly wasn't part of our group. We're, we're not related in, or connected in any way, it, despite what the media like to report, certainly the times. Fine. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm asking you the question really, rather than trying to impose anything on you here. I'm just, I'm just curious to know that given that you were both out on the weekend demonstrating or, or, or having, Showing yourselves in support of similar causes, you know, is there any is there any scope for cooperation with Nigel Farage? I've not really thought about it, if I'm honest. I've, I've it's not crossed my mind. I'm not sure whether Nigel. He, I mean, he's um, the most influential politician, whether you like him or not, for the last generation, and has brought around brought about real change in this country without having a single parliamentary seat. Uh, so whether you agree with him or not, you must really one must take one's hat off to his uh, ingenuity and steadfastness. But um, I'm not sure that he is. I'm not sure what his views are on the areas that I'm interested in. In terms of understanding where you are politically, though, it, it can be a little bit confusing because you also voted for Jeremy Corbyn in 2017. So what what was going through your mind there? Because that doesn't seem totally compatible with your political position now. Isn't it okay to vote for the manifesto that you like the most? 
So you, what was it about that manifesto that you particularly liked then? Because Jeremy Corbyn doesn't seem to stand for the same things that you currently stand for. Absolutely no idea. It's 2017. I took a look at, I took a long, hard, long, hard look at each manifesto, and I made up my mind based on which one I thought was the most deliverable. Uh, and this was pre-realizing what Jeremy Corbyn was. You know, was, so yeah, I think it's okay. It's fine to vote Labour. I, I think I probably voted Lib Dem as well at one at some point. It's just it's good. It's good to. It's good. You know, the, the, I mean, what, what are the parties nowadays? Do we? I mean, are the Conservatives even remotely conservative? I'd argue not. <laughs> So, um, no, no but, it, but well, you, you can argue what you like. But in 2017, there was a big difference between Jeremy Corbyn and Theresa May. I'm just trying to understand what it was about Jeremy Corbyn or his manifesto that you were drawn to just to understand what, what your politics are, really. <laughs> well, you know, I'm afraid I'm, I'd have to go back to 2017 for that one. OK, what, what is your ambition for the Reclaim Party? Do you intend to stand in, in next year's local elections, for example? Um, the thing is, the minute I say what my ambitions are, some certain other people start doing, start saying the same thing. So what I've worked out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep my ambitions really to myself until I announce them, yeah, until we launch formally. But ultimately, the aim is elected office, right? And that, that's, that's the point of a political party, I guess. Again, one has to, well, at the moment, we're, we're not even a political party at the moment. We, we've yet to go through the very clunky and muddy area of the Electoral Commission. Um, so at the moment we're just we're a movement, and we're a movement with 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 well once we're through the electoral commission we're a movement with enough fangs to be able to stand candidates in places, and uh, I absolutely would not rule that out at all. Okay, let's go back to being prime minister now, and you'll have some pretty pressing issues on your desk. Firstly, a new American president. Um, are you going to congratulate Joe Biden? Do you think if you're prime minister at this point, would you congratulate Joe Biden on his victory at this moment in time? I believe the election is still contested, isn't it, at the moment? I mean, he's not conceded um, Trump. So I suppose well, I, I'm, I'm, I have some vague memories of 2000 and Al Gore being president and there being a, a, you know, a wobbly area. So, you know, once it's, once it's officially announced, absolutely, you would, I would congratulate them. My, um, my, I like democracy. So if he's won, he's won. And then apparently he has, but apparently it's contested as well. I don't know. I think the pitch is pretty unclear on all of this, isn't it? Well, it seems fairly clear if, if you know, to the people who've been doing the counting and have come up with tallies that show that Joe Biden is is in the lead. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be any real basis to Donald Trump's claims that there's been electoral fraud. And um, Boris Johnson's yeah. congratulated Joe Biden on his election victory. And just it's just curious that that you feel... It's not certain at this stage that you wouldn't be rushing in to congratulate him at this stage. Well, I, I, as I said, I think he's uh, he's contesting the result, which he has a right to do, doesn't he? So Maybe. I mean, I, I'm I'm not a I'm not an American uh, legal expert or a um, or in charge of the areas where the polling is dis uh, sorry the voting is disputed. So I mean, I can't make a comment on on American politics in that way. All all I'm fairly sure of is that Trump is contesting the results of the election and then and therefore you know if he contests it and it, it turns on its head there, there'll be a lot of people with egg on their face and so I would rather go okay the legal process is taking place he has won the Supreme Court signed it off and then it congratulates you to Joe Biden and, and good luck on your next four years that's what I would say would be the approach um, Boris's tweet about building back better and climate change was, I found it a bit spooky, actually, if I'm honest. Do you think you could work with Joe Biden? Yeah, I can work with anybody. That's the whole point of life. You've got to be able to work with people, even if you don't like them. Or, I mean, not actually liking them doesn't come into it. Even if you disagree with someone politically, you should be, you should be able to work with them. There's, there's much common ground. We're, we're living in a world at the moment where we're making an assumption that if someone disagrees with you politically, there's no common ground. So, you know, in these very polarised times, I'm actually very welcoming and, and I'll sit and talk to anyone and give them the, the best of my uh, spirit. You know, so I can easily work with Joe Biden, yeah. I mean, you say that, though, Lawrence, you say that you're welcoming and that you, you just enjoy talking to people, but you, quite, you do quite enjoy being antagonistic as well. I mean, you do end up in lots of arguments. So why do you think that is? It can't, it can't just be everyone else. There must be something about you as well that, 
that ends up being argumentative. Wait, wait, do you have an example? Question time, for example, just turned into quite an antagonistic exchange. Uh, it seems often when you go onto television, you do end up in, in arguments with other panellists. I completely understand the media's desire to paint me as a sort of Farage-esque monster argument uh, who just who wants to contr who contrarian, who just wants to poke fires. But actually, when you're speaking the truth, um, it comes up against a lot of a lot of a lot of difficulty, and that's fine. But um, you know, I'm I'm secure in myself, so I know what my aims and achievements are. And if someone gives me it in the neck, they'll usually get it back. I don't take things lying down. OK, well, there's also the big issue of the pandemic, of course, and as Prime Minister, you'd have to work out what your strategy would be uh, in terms of tackling the pandemic. Um, you're not uh, a fan of lockdown. So so what would your strategy be? Um, give people their liberty back would be the first thing and end the lockdowns. Yeah. Go with the Great Barrington Declaration, which is right. And um, allow older people to make the older and vulnerable people to make their own decisions, but essentially shield them and let the virus do what viruses do, which is work their way through the population. Is is that and practical? Ruling by fear. Yeah, I don't see why it's not practical. Well, because older people, I mean, there is an argument, and it has been made by lots of people actually that you can sort of cocoon people and shield them. But the challenge is that you know they they have caring needs. Carers need to come into the homes, or family members need to come into their home, or they might live in multi generational homes. It's not practically that easy to to separate and to isolate older people or more vulnerable more vulnerable people from the virus. And which is why the government, partly why they took the decision to to lock down the whole of society, because then uh, it's easier to protect everyone if everyone's taking precautions. Mm, yeah, no, but there's also other considerations to be taken into account, aren't there? like the fact that we've just pushed our economy off the cliff and we're going to have the worst depression, probably worse than the depression in the 30s, that people are losing their jobs every single day and that when we wake up from this daydream, we're probably looking at hyper or massive inflation. You know, I mean, you've got, you, it's, not a, it's not a single issue. COVID has been politicised to such a point that it's become a single issue thing and actually there is a multifaceted way of looking at it. And I think that ultimately we, the first lockdown was so harsh and not resisted uh, correctly that we've given the government so much power that um, we're, we're, we've made some steps as a society that are, t that are going to have repercussions, which, is, which are very, very bad for democracy and for freedom. And I, I believe that you should be free and the government's job should be small and people should be free to, their personal liberty is the most important thing to them. What else would you do to, to bring this pandemic under control and, and perhaps to restore some of the jobs that have been lost? Well, I mean, that's, that's an entirely different ball game. What, what one would do. I'm not in government at the moment. And, you know, as you know, I'm pretty early on in my political career. So I think I'd, what I'd do is I'd assemble my, uh, my Chancellor of the Exchequer and his entire team of people that know exactly what's going on. You know, I would, I would just try and get the country moving, free it up, you know, allow people to move around would be would that. But this is, this is general stuff, just ideologically, I can't, specific um, post-COVID uh, economic policy is probably you're going to have to hang on for a bit for that one. You can do it. I mean, you can do anything you want as Prime Minister, aside from COVID-19. You can literally implement any policy you want, pass any law you want. Is there, is there something you'd want to do first, something that really burning that you would want to get achieved immediately? Um, yeah. I would. I, I, th I think children should learn British and European history till GCSE, mandatory, so that they understand when they sit there and <clears throat> tell you what, how the world is, that they at least have a perception of what, the, uh, what, the, what, what came in the last hundred years. At least, you know, British and European history till GCSE. I think only 40% of students do study history until GCSE, and I don't think that that curriculum is particularly is actually um, laid down as stone what they do study. So essentially, we're throwing a load of people out of school who don't really know uh, necessarily what happened in the past. And therefore, we don't, we're, we're doomed to repeat it. So I would definitely encourage the learning of history. Yeah, I think I'd do that straight away. I mean, you had a tricky spell at school, didn't you, getting chucked out before your A-levels? Was, was, school, was school not a particularly sort of happy place for you? Or what, what happened with all that? 
I love the way you're trying to present me as someone who's sort of, you know, difficult and contrarian and, you know, troubling and all this stuff. It's, it's not true. Um, I was very naughty at school, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I was just one of those naughty boys. I didn't like authority particularly when I, I you know, I came from a very, my family home where I grew up was very, very free. You know, we were encouraged to debate at length and in detail and disagree robustly and become friends at the end of it. You know, all the great things that you get around a dinner table. But take that into a pre-child act, uh, all boys boarding school, and you're going to come across a bit of uh, opposition, is what I would say. So I'd say I was the happy, clappy libertarian wandering around Harrow, which was a pretty staid organisation at that point. Uh, and uh, it's obviously vastly improved now. But yeah, I loved school. I loved the wonderful stuff that I learned about our beautiful, beautiful language from uh, in English. And I loved learning history. And I loved, obviously, my love of acting actually did form itself at school so i feel very blessed to have been to such a great school was i naughty yes did i um have slight indiscretion with a, a girl at the, the school ball which was once a year yes was i thrown out no did they ask me to come back and do my uh, a levels and then go back home to my mum and dad's house yes am i an old Arabian? yes so i wasn't actually kicked out i think it was just quite naughty it's all right so it's a myth then that you were kicked out. That's not. That's not true. Well, you know, I don't know where is it on my Wikipedia page. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there you go. <laughs> my Wikipedia yeah. page. Don't don't read everything you read. Don't leave everything you read on my Wikipedia page. Right. Some quick fire questions just to finish off this podcast now. Then, Lawrence. So, who would you rather form a coalition with? Say you did get into Parliament and you had a few MPs. Would you rather go into coalition with Keir Starmer or Boris Johnson? Boris Johnson. Yeah, you feel like you've got more in common with him, or what is it about Boris Johnson? Well, I'm not sure actually, because I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what I've got uh, in common. I'm not sure what Boris Johnson's got in common with Boris Johnson at the moment. So that's that's an entirely different ballgame. But certainly, I can't be. Um, I I think Keir Starmer has drunk their critical race theory Kool Aid, and that for me is an absolute no go. So I, I mean, I could I could never work with him until he, unless he sort of had a proper think about it and explain to me why his position was it was what it was. Okay, you can have anyone you like at all as your Chancellor. Who would you pick? Oh, can I just pick someone I like? Yeah, anyone. Doesn't even have to be a politician. Ben Bradley. Okay, yeah, the MP, Ben Bradley, yeah. Okay, Mansfield MP, Conservative. Um, would you let Scotland hold another referendum on independence? No. No. Well, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, it's up to Scotland, isn't it, at the end of the day, in a way, but it's, I think it, once in a generation means once in a generation. That's what I'd be. You know, yeah. and to me, a, a generation is a generation. It's not a couple of years or a few years. Uh, would you be prepared to press the nuclear button? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, what, what, no point in having a nuclear arsenal if you're not going to press a nuclear button. I mean, would you want to? No, goodness, no. But if uh, if you if someone launches a nuclear attack on you, I think you probably should launch a nuclear attack in return, shouldn't you? Mm -hmm. It's called mutually assured destruction. I think it works rather well. The whole point is that we don't we have nuclear weapons, so we don't use them. With that, you know, ultimately the whole point is if you do end up having to use them, which I don't believe will it will ever happen that you've got them there at your disposal. Yeah, that's the point. Okay, all right. Well, on that apocalyptic note, <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it there, Lawrence. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for coming on the podcast. It's been really interesting to talk to you. You too, my pleasure.